Thomas McCausher is a retired Connecticut complex litigation judge. He is the author of the 2023 book from Brandeis University Press, The Common Flaw, Needless Complexity in the Courts and 50 Ways to Reduce It. Thomas McCausher spent 40 years in federal courtrooms around the country and in trying hundreds of cases as a complex litigation judge in Connecticut. His decisions on the bench concerning education, opioid litigation, and the separation of powers earned national attention. Thomas McCausher also experienced the other branches of government before taking the bench, working in his state's governor's office and working as a state legislator, a lobbyist, and outside counsel to a congressional caucus chairman. During his years of practice, Mr. McCausher was co-chair of the ABA Committee on Employee Benefits, a regular lecturer on fiduciary litigation, and a co-editor and author of the Employee Benefits Committee's book, Employee Benefits Law. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction, and thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Thomas McCausher, and I'm a recently retired uh, complex litigation judge of the Superior Court uh, in Connecticut. Uh, and this is about reinvigorating the lawsuit. And essentially, it's basically the, the 40 years of experience that I've had in court and the lessons I've learned that I want to pass on to you. Uh, you know, when I started uh, practicing uh, long ago and far away, uh, my father had been practicing already since the 1940s, and he continued into the 2000s. Back then, lawyers went to court you know, a great deal, and lawyers went to court about all kinds of things. And so when I started to practice in my early years, uh, I did everything from uh, dog bites to divorces to some petty criminal matters uh, to small claims to practicing in front of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. Uh, ultimately, as law practices tended to specialize Mine did too. And I spent about 30 years of my practice litigating in federal courts uh, across the country in that obscure area of the law known as ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, and dealing with breach of fiduciary duty cases, basically pension frauds and pension scams uh, that I litigated from California courts to Connecticut, all of them federal. Uh, about uh, nine separate uh, court of appeals I argued in and 13 U.S. district courts that I litigated in, uh, as well as the United States Supreme Court. Uh, I followed that with 10 years on the uh, Connecticut State Court bench, two years doing almost every kind of case, uh, and then ultimately eight years doing complex litigation, six of those years uh, in civil complex cases, commercial cases, constitutional cases, and then the last two years as a presiding judge for complex family court cases, which of all the different things I've done in my career were actually the most difficult because they required the most excruciating judgments. Uh, and in that process, I learned about things in litigation uh, that I thought were useful to the goal of winning uh, and things that I thought were needless. Uh, and I put those things ultimately in a book called The Common Flaw, Needless Complexity in the Courts and 50 Ways uh, to Reduce It. And I'm not going to go into all 50 ways today. I want to focus on reinvigorating the lawsuit from the standpoint of the practicing attorney, because that's our audience here. And I want to do it in a way to help you do the thing that I think you should be aiming at doing, which is to make winning your winning strategy. And I think too often needless complexity means that a lawsuit doesn't uh, become about a case that you want to win. The case becomes about the case itself. The parties bludgeon each other with motion practice and discovery, and then the parties are broke uh, and are forced into an unsatisfactory settlement. I don't think that's a good way uh, to run a strategy for winning a, a case or a good strategy ultimately for business uh, because unsatisfactory settlements, coercion into resolving a case and the huge outflow of money that falls 
just makes people do the one thing you don't want them to do, stay away from court. Uh, and they want to do it at almost all costs today. So let's get into what we could do about uh, cases to reinvigorate the lawsuit uh, and to make lawsuits more about, uh, about the people and the values that are in them and the notion about uh, winning a lawsuit uh, as opposed to merely litigating. So let's start with the, the problem starts first, and that is with the complaint. And I would urge on you that the best complaints are comprehensible complaints rather than needlessly comprehensive complaints. I like to quote Judge Richard Posner uh, in saying that the problem with complaints today is that the idea of a plain and short statement of the claim has not caught on. And Judge Posner was there quoting from the federal rules of civil procedure. That's what the rules say, a short and plain statement. And most uh, state courts have the same rules in them too. And that's the, those are the rules talking. But some developments in the courts uh, have led people to make their complaints ever longer and ever less, frankly, useful to their readers. A big development of this that I discuss in The Common Flaw is the U.S. Supreme Court's rulings in the Iqbal and Twombly cases that many of you uh, have heard of. And I think the Supreme Court conceived of those rulings uh, as things that were meant to sort the wheat from the chaff uh, in complaints. But in fact, what they produced really is nothing but more chaff. Complaints have become needlessly longer, with longer jurisdictional statements, longer background sections, uh, and even brief-like recitations of legal arguments, which is not what complaints are supposed to be about. They're supposed to be about the facts. Most of all, they seem to, to uh, uh, have resulted, the two decisions, in an endless duplication of causes of action. People who used to bring one or two causes of action now are bringing four and five, and some who used to bring five are, are now making those 10 uh, or 12 causes of action. <clears throat> we all know in writing these things that many of them are simply throwaways, long shots. And what we don't realize that uh, happens when we do things like that is that we're actually detracting from our stronger claims. In my view, uh, cases don't require multiple causes of action to be credible. They require, in fact, is something uh, at the central core of a human value. Most complaints, you know, are things about which a third grader could give an easy, com uh, an easy explanation of. Uh, in my experience, going all the way back to military school, most wrongs, most complaints are about things that involve things like lying, cheating, stealing, uh, and injuring people. And we think about complaints, uh, for instance, for personal injuries, we have injuring people. When we think about people not keeping their word, cheating on their contracts, lying about what they're going to do, or, or obviously in fraud cases, uh, stealing and the things, these all have central human values and statutes have them, case laws have them. And getting in touch with those should be what a complaint uh, ought to be about. Now, I has, used to have to write some fairly long complaints because I guess I thought that was going to help my clients. In reality, I wouldn't have written them the way I did now. But one thing I do, did do, which I'll strongly recommend to you if you feel obliged to continue to write needlessly complex and long complaints, is to at least begin it with that third grader summary. What I used to do when I wrote a complaint was have the very first section be called summary. Just write the word summary and a colon before anything else is, is, is written, even the jurisdictional and all the other things. And I never got in trouble for it. No one ever complained about it. In fact, I found that judges actually knew what my complaints were about because I put these summaries in. And the summary would say that third grader explanation. Uh, <clears throat> Jane Smith hit me with her car. She broke my leg. She damaged my car. I lost time at work. It cost me money. I had to have my car repaired, that cost me money, uh, and I had to pay my medical bills, and it cost me money. And believe it or not, even far more complex cases can benefit from a summary like that, and usually there actually is a reason behind 
the lawsuit that can be summarized in simpler, simple terms. So and so is choking off and dominating the market for uh, pies within the southeastern region of the United States, an antitrust claim. Uh, this party promised to pay me uh, a certain amount of money for performing a series of duties and didn't pay it, a contract claim. This person stole my trade secret recipe for uh, chicken, uh, and it's cost me a lot of money and I want it back. Uh, really, when you look at it, most complaints have something like that at the core. And we should give details about those things. Give details about those parts of the complaint that go to that central human value and are contested. Think of them as the facts that highlight the wrong that motivated the lawsuit in the first place and make them jump off the page in a way that a court says, something wrong has been done here. I'll have to hear from both sides, but very quickly on in looking at your complaint, the court should be able to conclude something wrong here happened. And then give short shrift to the uncontested parts of the complaint. You shouldn't have pages about uncontested jurisdictional claims. In federal court, for instance, if it's a federal statute case, you can write briefly what the federal statute says and that you're suing on it. If it's diversity, we all know, you know what has to be uh, alleged about the parties and the amount in controversy, but we don't need to go on and on about it, especially when we can anticipate that the other side isn't going to uh, make a dispute about whether you belong in a certain court or not. Yet people do it anyway, uh, because they think it makes them look thorough. It actually just bores everybody. Uh, as does needless background about the parties and their relationships. In a contract case, you're, if you're suing about the breach of a fourth contract, you really don't need to belabor contracts one, two, and three, and all the details about them. You don't need to give an endless background about the people. You need to give that background that goes to hammer away at that human value and why that value uh, was uh, violated in the particular case. And one thing that I'll say more than once uh, today in this discussion, please spare us your acronyms and your here and after referred to as. Uh, if you think that these things make your complaint more understandable, uh, you don't understand what makes a complaint understandable. Uh, giving a, uh, a company uh, that might be uh, John Joseph James Jr., uh, incorporated uh, a long acronymical name that the party, the judges and everybody else who reads it then have to try to remember throughout the rest of your complaint in your case, you're making a big mistake. Call them Jones, call them the manufacturer, call them the, uh, the baker, the butcher, whatever they are, the candlestick maker, but don't use acronyms that are not self-explanatory and don't use them when you don't need them. And don't characterize whole swaths of your complaint with a here and after referred to thing, unless that here and after referred to thing directly invokes the thing that's at issue. Uh, so drop those things and we'll have a better complaint. Uh, remember, needlessly uh, complex co complaints actually get the case off on the very place you don't want it. It's on the wrong track from the very start. A needlessly complex uh, complaint calls for one thing, a needlessly complex response. Uh, and that's where we're going today. Yeah, long complaints, complex complaints, needlessly so, invite a hailstorm of usually sequentially filed motions that today routinely include things like attacks on the court's subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction challenges, venue claims, and the inevitable legal insufficiency claims which are also often filed seriatim, one after the other after the other, uh, and then motions for summary judgment. And you have this list of things that each one of them requires a briefing schedule for a motion, a response, a reply. At each stage, one party to the other is gonna ask for more time to, to do the briefing. Each one of them then would require oral argument. Each one of them would take a decision from a judge which might take as much, some weeks, might take months. And yes, I've seen them take years to decide a single motion. And then you have five more motions after that. That's how we can see why a piece of uh, litigation that 
we've made complex can last 10 years, sometimes even more. If I had my way, what people would adopt uh, is the only one of the things that I listed that's really the best motion that's worth talking about, and that's the motion for summary judgment. Uh, and I'd like to make a case for why the summary judgment motion is the best pretrial motion of all. And that's partly in, for, if, in the first point, because the more motions that a parties file, the less momentum the case has. Now, just as, that, just as there's a real human wrong, a human value at stake in a complaint, at the center of a complaint, there's usually a real reason, a real reason why a party thinks that complaint fails. If there isn't, you might consider settling the case, but usually there is. And in the interest of the, your client, the longer you take to get at that real reason, the higher the expense uh, runs in the case, the longer the case lasts, and the more dissatisfied the client's going to be with the experience that they're having. Yes, you may be billing hours, but you also might at the same time be alienating your client and wishing they could do anything to avoid litigating again. So I urge you to get at that central point as early, as strongly as you can. And I think summary judgment is the way to do that. And that's because uh, it benefits the clients by concentrating on that central issue. It also benefits the judge and the courts uh, in two ways. And that's because courts are most efficient when they resolve cases on their facts. This, this is because, first of all, they're less likely to see the case again and again. Think what happens when there's a 12B6 motion in federal court, or the usual legal sufficiency challenge under your state court rules, wherever you may be, uh, that, that challenge is often followed by another challenge. So the court finds that some magic words have been left out, count, out of count number 23 and count number four, and these things get dismissed. Uh, and inevitably what happens is they're simply recharacterized. Even if you throw the whole complaint out, they're recharacterized and filed all over again. What happens? Many times, too many times these days, there's another motion to dismiss, to strike, what have you, a demur, as we used to say, and the whole process starts all over again. So from the judge's standpoint, all this means is they keep seeing the same case over and over and over again, starting at square one. So if they did the legal sufficiency challenge in conjunction with other things on a motion for summary judgment, they only have to do it once. Second, when a case is decided on its facts, the good news for a judge is it's harder to overturn it. So when a judge can decide something on summary judgment where the law and the facts are conjoined in one single motion, it gets over in a way that the judge can be pleased with because it's less likely they're going to be overturned because they've considered some aspect of the facts. Maybe there's simply no facts that support the claim, or maybe the question is so much a matter of law that it doesn't even matter what the facts can be. Uh, a single motion can then focus the case on its key issues and resolve it once and permanently. So what you do is you combine your throwaway jurisdictional challenges with your meteor claims of legal insufficiency. If it's purely a legal question, at least put those two together. But yet, better yet, wrap them all together into a summary judgment motion. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that discovery is going to stand in the way of that summary judgment motion. Uh, and yes, of course, in a summary judgment motion, the only fair thing for any judges uh, to do is to allow the necessary discovery to be done before the motion can be filed. But that doesn't mean that that necessary discovery has to lapse into what most discovery lapses into these days. And that is an endless, grinding, expensive, and exhaustive process that only leads the case to an unsatisfactory settlement. So if you're trying to move the case forward from the plaintiff's standpoint or for the defense standpoint, and you want to use the summary judgment method, the thing to do at the outset of the case, when you're warning the court that you have these legal claims to bring, uh, also say that you'd like to get whatever discovery is necessary to a motion for summary judgment done immediately. Here's how you do it. 
you ask the judge for a discovery conference and you either get this with the judge or you get this with a magistrate judge in, in federal court often. And what you ask them to do is not to permit discovery, but to order discovery, order certain specific documents to be exchanged, order certain specific questions to be answered, order certain depositions to be taken. And when a judge orders these things, in the judge's own words, they're unlikely to end up in the mess that usually follows the ordinary unsupervised discovery process, which works usually like the following. Uh, a needlessly complex and long list of interrogatories with their definitions and their production requests are served by one party on the other. The other party inevitably asks for more time. Depending on your rules, it might be 30 days, 60 days, what have you. Uh, in any case, the other side usually says they're very busy, need some more time to provide you with answers. But what happens at the end of that extended period is also typical. What happens at the end of the extended period is if they don't ask for another extension, they inevitably deliver to you uh, objections to every definition, to every interrogatory, to every production request. And they usually sound something like this. Uh, the uh, interrogatory is objected to because it's overly broad, unduly burdensome, vague, not reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence and calls for legal conclusions. It's a formula and often it's repeated regardless of what the question is and regardless, frankly, of what the real objection is. And so you get this boilerplate uh, in your email or however it's conveyed to you. And then you have to start the process which every court would then expect of you, which is you have to start negotiating with the other side. It took you months to get that initial response and it's gonna take you months to go back and forth with the lawyer for the other side in order to try to uh, work out an agreement. And maybe that yields some tiny bits of information. But it usually, it often, too often, doesn't resolve the question. And what happens next is you go back into the uh, merry-go-round of motion practice, where the party that got unsatisfactory responses or stuck with these boilerplate responses then has to file a motion to compel responses, <clears throat> which, of course, requires them to file a brief which takes months to develop, apparently, uh, and then requires a response, which also takes months, and usually it involves requests for extensions of time, as does the reply brief, uh, and then there's the negotiating process of when it's going to be heard uh, by the judge. In some courses, it's faster than others, but some places it can take months just to get heard for oral argument on a motion uh, to compel discovery. After the oral argument, the judge then has to make uh, a written ruling, uh, and that can take months. And yes, I have seen it taken, taking years to get a discovery response. So no wonder you're thinking, I can't do the summary judgment motion. I have to go through all that discovery. Well, if the court manages discovery at your request, instead of allowing the free-for-all of current contemporary discovery practices, you can get to that summary judgment motion faster. The judge simply lists the things that are going to be disclosed, lists the questions that must be answered, above all, lists the documents that must be uh, produced and when, along with depositions that can be allowed to be taken. Now you're also probably thinking, well, what if there are going to be follow-up questions? How am I going to do the follow-up questions? Well, you simply ask again the court to hold a discovery conference and to consider the follow-up questions and to consider making orders ordering those follow-up things. All of this can be done uh, with video conferences, without briefing, uh, really on short notice. Uh, in, one, in my court, I typically did them. You, you want a discovery conference? I'm on trial. At the end of my day, I have 25 minutes. I'll hear your discovery issue. I'll listen to what it is you have to say. I'll write an order. It gets out right away. Uh, don't be afraid to ask courts to do that. A lot of judges uh, want to uh, assist the bar and like ideas that promote efficiency. And frankly, no judge likes thumbing through uh, the endless interrogatory and production pages and the briefs that go along with them one by one or considering them that way at oral argument. What they'd want to hear at oral argument is, what is it you're trying to get? Not what interrogatory number 356 says. If you use that method, 
you can then shortcut the system that normally means that motion practice doesn't get heard for potentially years. Use that, get to summary judgment, uh, and you're going to uh, uh, have one motion, one hearing, one resolution, and potentially victory uh, or defeat in the lawsuit without waiting the months and years that cost so much money. Now, let's assume you're going to get closer to the business of actually having a trial. The next thing I'd urge upon you uh, is that you should spend your time on the eve of trial preparing to present the facts of your case, not needless motions in limine. Used as part of some sort of pre-trial taunting, uh, the motion in limine needlessly delays the trial because they usually take days or weeks to wade through when they have to be briefed, uh, et cetera. And too often, it really is just starting the case back where it began, which is their challenges to jurisdiction or legal sufficiency that are simply repeated, perhaps for the purpose of giving young associates something to do, perhaps for the purpose of sort of taunting the other side and making things difficult for them. Uh, perhaps delay the foundation for an appeal, but usually it's not much about preparing for trial. When it is, it's often a preemptory way of bringing up issues that are likely to get resolved at trial anyway. Evidentiary objections that you could make during the trial just as easily, and you could get a ruling simply by having the jury go out of the room if it's a jury trial or something of the like, because many, many times the easiest thing for a judge to do in response to your motion and limit is to reserve judgment on it until trial. Yes, you might have the clash over whether an expert could be allowed. And yes, there are times when a motion in limine uh, is, is, is important, but too many times it's the busy work that parties do prior to the trial one that you really do, what they really should do. Lawyers are better off focusing on what facts they must prove, how they'll prove them, and how they're going to forge these facts uh, into a victory. Remember, you're not merely trying to confound your opponents with multiple motions. You should be trying to defeat them. And facts matter most at a trial. And when you're thinking about preparing those facts for presentation, you should be thinking about your examination of your witnesses above all things. And you should realize that the questions that you're going to ask your witnesses should be a hammer on the anvil of one of your, of, of your themes. They aren't, don't ask those questions. And remember this, you heard this before, maybe in law school and subsequently uh, uh, repeatedly heard, never ask a question when you don't know the answer. Yet you always do, <laughs> or at least most of you do. I've certainly found in court that uh, Lawyers ask questions where they have no idea what the answer is going to be, and they find themselves ambushed and unprepared uh, to how to deal it, how to deal with the answer that they're actually given. So if you don't know what your answer options are, what kind of answers you would get, and what you're going to do in response, to them, don't ask the question. Now, when I practice law and I had to present a case and ask questions of a witness, I would... Uh, First of all, make sure my questions are showcasing my theme, uh, which was typically about kinds of cheating and stealing, pension fraud cases. Uh, and how am I going to bring those things to life? And the way I did it was to work out every question and the prospective answers I might get for every witness. I didn't spend my time on those motions in limine. I'll explain in a little bit that I didn't spend my time putting enormous uh, books full of exhibits a bit together either. I focused on my time and how I'm going to put those facts forward, what a live witness can do and how to present it. Every question, every potential answer, and what my response to those answers would be. It seems almost uh, hornbook rules, really, about how to present a case. I have to say, in the 10 years that I've been on the bench, hardly any lawyers have, have followed that. I find them having uh, questions scribbled on a legal pad, even though they filed you know, 10 motions in limine, the questions they're going to ask at trial, they scribble out roughly and end up sort of floundering around with the witness. Don't flounder, because when you flounder, your, your case flounders. Uh, and spend your time hammering your theme. Unfortunately, this just does not happen at trial. 
90% of trial time is actually spent proving things that are ultimately undisputed. Uh, and you're maybe worried, how do I prove these undisputed facts? I still have to put on testimony and evidence concerning them. How do I do it? Well, here's how you should do it instead of the way we do it now, where it takes up most of the trial time. And that is to use trial admissions to focus the trial on the dispute and not the undisputed. Admitted facts don't need any support or a witness to recite them. They should be listed and then given to the trier of fact. You can serve these requests for admissions under the practice book rules wherever you're uh, practicing uh, as ordinary admissions. But most ordinary admissions are a complete waste of time and lots of people don't use them because they simply are used to uh, try to get the other side to admit the cause of action, basically. Admit you were negligent, admit you were careless, admit you breached the contract. All of these things being wrong when they should be better focused on undisputed things. Like these are the contract terms. This is what the tax return said. Here's what someone said in an email. Uh, and so you can serve those things under the ordinary rules of the admissions process, but often they result in the same sort of annoying objections, et cetera. So ask for the court's intervention, particularly at a, uh, a, a pre-trial management conference, a trial management conference. You can ask the court to order the parties to work on a joint stipulated list of undisputed facts. Here's what to ask for. At the trial, ask for to use a series of conclusions that would be labeled as admitted facts or undisputed facts. They're to give to the judge if it's a, well, and the jury. You know, in other words, if it's a judge and jury, the judge gets a copy, the jury gets a copy. Every juror has a list of these unadmitted facts. They can eliminate a whole swath uh, of witnesses. For instance, they deal with things such as, what does a tax return show? It's never really disputed, to my, in my experience, what a tax return shows, whether it's an honest tax return, may be disputed. But the fact that it reported $250,000 of income usually isn't disputed. So what do you need the tax return for? What do you need someone to testify about what the tax return shows? It should simply be undisputed that the tax return shows $250,000 of income. Let me give you an example of how a, a very good uh, cross-examination could be uh, destroyed in terms of its effectiveness by what typically we spend our time on in trial. It's from the movie A Few Good Men, and I use that in the common flaw as an example of, of how trials end up chasing their tails. In A Few Good Men, there's this wonderful scene when... Uh, the Marine Corps uh, colonel, played by Jack Nicholson, uh, is confronted by the defense attorney, Tom Cruise, uh, and the issue uh, is about the use of some call logs from the Guantanamo Bay base and an inventory of a private who died uh, in service to his country had in his footlocker and things, an inventory of items. And you'll notice in the scene that no time is spent on the inventory uh, and the phone log. It simply assumed what they show. Uh, and uh, the phone log is used to show that there's not something in it that represents a call from the particular private. The footlocker is shown, the inventory of the footlocker is shown that nothing was packed by this person who supposedly, according to Jack Nicholson's character, was leaving the Marine Corps base the next day. Tom Cruise, hammers away uh, on the implications of these two facts. Nothing in the code, uh, phone log, nothing uh, packed in the, uh, in, the, in the record of what's in the footlocker, nothing's been packed up for travel. He hammers away at his theme of the incongruity of that fact and doesn't spend any time authenticating these lists or anything else. And this is because perhaps he knew enough to make it an undisputed fact that there was no record of a phone call from the uh, uh, from the base and no record of anything in the footlocker inventory showing anything was packed up. And so if you have these things undis undisputed, you can focus on the dispute. 
the long part of a question in that situation often ends up containing the undisputed. And then you ask the real question at issue. Let's take the example of a financial issue, which comes up in obviously many uh, commercial cases and in family court, et cetera. So let's say you have this. Uh, you have certain things you've had undisputed, the amount of the income, the amount of the bank balance. So you could ask a question in the following way. You reported $250,000 on your tax return, but your accounts show that you had $350,000 of paycheck deposits. Now the real question, what explains the difference? In a typical lawsuit, what the case be, would actually spend most of its time on is trying to establish that the tax return shows $250,000 of income uh, and that the payroll deposits show $350,000 of deposits. Many times, uh, you know, in progressively minded uh, lawyers' opinions or judges, they might ask the parties to stipulate to the admission of the bank record uh, and the tax return. But then we're doing another thing that we should also do while we're eliminating needless witnesses who would authenticate these documents, Elim eliminate the documents themselves. You should eliminate needless exhibits. They smother the important ones and they are by far the largest uh, group of exhibits that get offered, the needless ones. Most cases yield pallets, whole pallets of exhibits, emails, medical records, financial documents, and the like. And you should consider that when you exchange your exhibit list and the other side says they have no objection to 175 of your 200 exhibits, that there's something wrong with that picture. It usually means that when nobody opposes the exhibits, it means they do not object to or dispute the fact for which you are offering those exhibits, which means that making them pile up in front of the judge or in front of the jury is a complete waste of time and is probably smothering some important exhibits. The one, two, three, or four important exhibits that I have found are at the center of every case. Uh, so eliminate the exhibits. You do that, of course, by having the things that you're trying to prove in them be undisputed or stipulated facts, the contents of the tax return, the dollar amount in a bank account, the contents of an email, the key paragraph of a contract, and the like. Uh, instead, what we actually do is that more time uh, is spent a trial trying to establish the routine at the expense of the extraordinary, the things that make or break a party's case. In other words, we spend our time on needless complexity. Let's let's take a look again at uh, how the, uh, the scene in A Few Good Men could have evolved in a typical courtroom. Remember that there's uh, involved a phone log, uh, in an inventory of the footlocker of the of the uh, Marine Corps private. In the average courtroom, you'd end up having to have both witnesses and documents to establish something that ultimately is, isn't going to be disputed. And so you might have a witness that's called to the stand, uh, and, and it might involve and unfold like this. Uh, please give us your name. My name is John Smith. Uh, what do you do? I'm with the United States Marine Corps. Uh, what do you do with the Marine Corps? I'm a telephone operator. Where are you a telephone operator? I'm a telephone operator at Guantanamo Bay. What are your duties of operating being a telephone operator? Well, I operate the telephones and I also keep uh, the records. Do you keep records of the telephone calls that are made? Well, or, or better yet, what records do you keep? Well, I keep all kinds of records, including the, the bills that we have to pay for the phones. We also keep records of the uh, phones, uh, calls that are actually made to and from the base. And for what period of time did you do that? I've done this for the last six years. Did you do it between this period and this period? I did it between that period and that period. I'm now going to show you something that's marked as exhibit number 328. Do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. What is it? It's the phone logs from Guantanamo Bay for the period June to July 2001. And uh, uh, was it your duty to keep these logs? Yes. How were they generated? 
Uh, they were generated automatically by the system. Was it the uh, customary practice of the Guantanamo Bay phone operators to keep these logs? Yes. Were they generated uh, in the ordinary course of your duties? Yes, they were. Uh, was it, uh, were they kept and generated in a manner contemporaneous to uh, the time at which this record was actually printed? Yes, they were. Uh, and it was your routine to do this? Yes, it was. I offer the exhibit number 300 and whatever it was. Uh, and the other side answers, no objection. And the judge, having nodded off, wakes back up and says, okay, let's go have lunch now. Uh, and that's the way that could have unfolded. And instead, in the movie, it unfolds with Tom Cruise hammering away at the incongruity of the things that were already admitted to be true. No record of a phone call for someone leaving a base. No family call, nothing. Uh, and the incongruity of not packing, even though the man was leaving the next morning. And even though that the Colonel, Colonel Jessup, the Jack Nicholson character, admitted that he packed and he uh, made phone calls for his trip to Washington to testify in the trial. So why wouldn't the, why wouldn't this private leaving the base forever do the same thing? And he went round and round on that actually important point until Jessup, the Colonel, breaks uh, and goes into his famous, you can't handle the truth explanation. Uh, and then uh, admits that in fact, the he had ordered a so-called code red, in which unfortunately the private was beaten until uh, until he died. So that's the way to use undisputed facts to win the disputed issues. Now let's uh, focus on another thing that takes up time and money uh, and that we shouldn't uh, be wasting so much of it on. Uh, and that is needless expert testimony. Because of needless expert testimony, expert testimony is losing its impact in court. You know, we should worry that the entire idea of expertise is being undercut when matters of common sense or matters impossible to calculate are being calculated by experts with pseudoscientific assurances. To keep expert witness testimony credible, we should use that testimony sparingly. Too often experts end up today being perceived as little better than hired guns when we used to think of them as disinterested sages who might come from the university and tell us with their thick foreign accents how they worked out the problem regardless of whose side it favored or not. Instead, we know this side has its expert and this side has an expert, and they're gonna say the exact opposite things from the same evidence. To be valuable, an expert should tell us something we don't already know or can't perceive in better ways uh, by ourselves. Uh, if they have something uh, where we use it, where they have something useful to say that we can actually employ, they might actually be better respected. Let's take the case of accident reconstructionists, for instance. Everybody seems to think that they need to use them. Even in a case where they, for instance, have eyewitnesses at the scene, the expert witness simply piles on and one witness for one side takes a bent piece of metal and reaches a conclusion about that bent piece of metal that is the complete opposite of the conclusion of the other expert about the bent piece of metal. Likewise, the skid marks are seen by one party uh, in one light and the other expert in exactly the opposite light. Uh, believe me, witnesses are more likely to be believed than accident reconstructionists who tout their scientific uh, credentials and then simply contradict each other in pseudoscientific terms. I'm not saying they can't be useful. It's just too often they aren't. And I can tell you in family court, uh, the increasing layering of expertise is getting in between the judge and the human value that the judge has to, has to decide the human issue. Question, say, of custody of a minor child. Painful business to have to decide. But in the end, it's the facts that decide it. And then the judge's own human judgment about what those facts mean. Too often in family court, it appears like everybody's trying to avoid having the judge make that uh, judgment. Often there's a court agency, a family services agency that works for the court system 
that gives its opinion. Then we often appoint a guardian ad litem, and the guardian ad litem gives the opinion. Often today we have competing custody evaluators from each side, psychologists, psychiatrists, every form of expertise, all trying to do the thing that the judge really has to do themselves, which is to decide the case from the facts based upon the simple premise that you're supposed to ju judge the matter on what is the best interest of the child. Uh, at competing experts too often simply diminish our respect for the business of expertise. Now, let's turn to uh, needless uh, time usage in court uh, and a, a way to address it using a time clock. And I urge you to propose a time clock uh, at your next trial. And that's because trials too often illustrate Parkinson's law. And that is the length of an individual activity invariably uh, expands to fill the allotted time granted to it. In a, and, and in a case in which you have no limit, you also have no end. So if, uh, I've watched, especially in courtside trials, a case with no specific end date, uh, left with a situation in which uh, it can go on for years. Because parties have uh, other cases that they have motions pending on, they wanna take a break in the trial to do that. And sometimes they take a break here of a few days and here a month there, uh, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, and the parties simply feel that the more testimony they put on, the more chance they have of winning the case. So to me, a chess clock is a splendid way uh, to deal with that. Uh, and here's how it works. And I first saw it in a case that I had in the Northern District of San Francisco in front of a judge named William Alsop, uh, in which an erisic fraud case in which uh, the, clock, the uh, chess clock was employed uh, in the following manner. Uh, chess clocks have two time limits on them. That, uh, both are given an even amount of time. In a case, of course, you have to negotiate in the court ultimate orders how many minutes you're going to get, how many minutes your opponent gets. They start on the clock. Whenever the lawyer for one side is speaking, that clerk then punches that side of the clock and their minutes start to run down. Uh, and that means their minutes are running not just when it's their part of the case. Those minutes also run down when they're objecting to testimony, making motions, and yes, when they're needlessly laying the foundation to admit a document about which there's no dispute. Uh, and I have found that with the clock running, you get fewer frivolous objections, fewer need, uh, needless exhibits, and fewer redundant witnesses. Uh, and also, and probably most importantly, what happens is it's an amazing uh, stimulant to the parties to actually seek each other out uh, and start to stipulate to, to facts like the ones I've been describing that should be used at every point. Uh, is there a constitutional right to put on a trial as long as you like? I don't think anyone would seriously contend that. Certainly people contend that due process requires a fair hearing and a fair time to put that hearing on. So that just means that in other words, the trick with a time clock is not so much uh, whether to use it or not, it's to allocate a fair amount of minutes. Obviously, if you allocate an unfair amount of minutes, it might create a basis for an appeal. Uh, and obviously, a judge could be overturned for being unfair about the minutes. But there's nothing unfair about uh, cutting out time that was used, wasting the court's time, time spent on needless complexity. An upper court isn't going to overturn you when you didn't allow a party to waste the court's time. In fact, the federal rules and most courts uh, local rules, most courts, uh, state court rules, have provisions in it that allow courts to deny the admission of evidence that is simply a waste of time. And the time clock is a magnificent way to stop that waste. Another time piece of uh, waste that goes on in most uh, trials is the use of prior testimony. I love the use of prior testimony, but you should make a point, not a muddle, of the use of prior testimony. 
most times the use of prior testimony turns into nothing better than a than a real bore because it's fumbled through in most of the, the kinds of examinations that go on in the typical courtroom. Prior contradictory testimony, usually these are from depositions, can expose witnesses lying. Witnesses are lying, uh, but too many people, too many lawyers putting on cases lose the essence uh, of that contradiction by fumbling through the process of pointing out uh, the, the contradiction. Uh, here's what it looks like. Uh, the lawyer has the uh, party opponent on the witness stand uh, and wants to use a uh, contradiction. Let's say that the party says today that they've been to this boathouse at issue never before, never been before there. And at their deposition, they said, yes, I've been there before. And there's a contradiction. It would often go like this, though, uh, <clears throat> when you're trying to bring that contradictory prior testimony in. The lawyer would say, didn't you give a deposition in this case? And the witness would say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you mean. I don't remember what you're talking about. Didn't you come to my office and have a question and answer uh, session here in front, of, in front of a stenographer? Oh, that. I remember that now. And so you get over that part. And the next thing uh, you say, and didn't you swear an oath to tell the truth at that deposition? And the party says, it was two years ago. I don't remember what I did. And then the party has to go through the laborious part and undisputed part. And the witness took an oath to tell the truth of the deposition. And then it goes on to the next stage of this uh, of this unfortunate sequence uh, where the lawyer then asks, didn't I ask you at your deposition whether you'd been to the boathouse before? And the witness against us. I don't remember. It was two years ago. Then you have to prove that you asked the question of the witness. And then you have to prove the answer as well. Uh, this is a shame because uh, it's so much better when, to not interact with the witness. There's a better way to offer prior testimony that focuses on the thing you're trying to focus on, the contradiction, not the process of authenticating a deposition transcript, the fact that an oath was taken, uh, et cetera, that is all undisputed. I've never seen in 40 years in court, someone say that the deposition transcript was a fake. Maybe it happens, but usually it's totally undisputed. And yet this interaction goes on anyway. Don't interact the witness with the witness. Set the stage, get permission from the court, and simply read the contradiction into the record. Here's how it can go. Your Honor, with respect to the statement that the witness has never been to the boathouse before, I wish to offer the witness's deposition from January 1st, 2023, page 15, beginning at line 12. May I have permission to read it for the purposes of impeaching the witness's current testimony? Very well, the court might say, have you got the deposition opposing counsel? Are we ready? Very well, you may begin. And the party, the lawyer then just reads the question. Have you ever been to the boathouse before? Answer, yes. Your Honor, I ask you and the ladies and gentlemen of the jury to note the contradiction. On to the next question. No fumble. And speaking of fumbling, cross-examine crisply, crushingly, or not at all. And remember, don't ask a question when you don't know the answer you're getting. Time spent on cross-examination is usually most effective when it's a series of forced concessions. Um, it's a word-for-word -word match often I have used uh, with the deposition. Concessions are made at the deposition and you want the client, I mean, the clients of the party opponent's client to confirm those concessions uh, during the trial. And you walk through them one after the other, and you're in a position where the party simply cannot agree with you, disagree with you, without you contradicting them from something from their deposition. And once you do that, you have a short, crisp statement, and the witness disagrees with it, and you have it uh, on the deposition, you slam them with the deposition in the way I just indicated, and then do it again, and then do it again. Often you'll find by the third or fourth contradiction of that type, that the witness uh, folds their tent uh, and simply starts to agree with you without your forcing them to do it. Uh, and again, when you don't know where that witness is going, don't ask the questions. And uh, you might say, refrain from cross-examination unless you can reign. In particular, why would you want to give a good witness for the other side the stage when you could potentially bring your best witness back to testify 
and take that stage away from you. Now, you've heard me talk about admissions and time clocks and the rest of it. And I don't want you to think from that by any stretch of the imagination that this means that uh, court trials should be antiseptic things about exchanging documents where everything is admitted in stipulated facts. Uh, trials shouldn't be just about a bunch of admissions that are exchanged. Uh, drama is what the court session should be about. And drama in court is not a bad thing. It's the lack of drama that's killing us. It's making trials a penitential and uninteresting thing for judges, juries, and lawyers. Uh, and if all an examination by a lawyer of a witness boils down to is scorning the witness with uh, anger and testimony, don't bother doing it. That's not the kind of drama I mean. Watch Tom Cruise again uh, in A Few Good Men. Watch any version of Witness for the Prosecution. Uh, watch any episode of Rumpel of the Bailey, and you'll see what I mean. There's a dramatic focal point. There's a human value at stake and in contention at the center of every case. Get at it. Now let's move to another place where the drama is drained out of a case and we're left with need the kind of needless complexity I'm talking about in the common flaw. And that is jury instructions. Human eyes are overstuffed, bewildering jury charges and interrogatories. Jurors hate their instructions because they're often too long, they contain too much jargon, and they're usually badly organized. And this is because many of those people who are drafting jury instructions, this includes judges and the parties, too often quote either exactly or too closely the legalese that are used on a point by the appellate courts. Try to remember what your jury instructions are for. They're for the jury. Leave the appeal to later. Try to win the case. You try to win the case by giving jury instructions that they can jurors instructions that they can understand and that might lead them to rule in favor of your client. Most appeals fail, remember that. So focus as you're developing your case in court, not on what you're going to do on appeal, but on persuading the people you're in front of right then and there. Help jurors by developing human-centered jury instructions. Jury instructions never have to have technical terms in that uh, are necessary to accurately explain the law. In other words, you don't need to use any of the jargon. Let's take an example, and I use this in my book. Um, never say the words proximate cause. You just don't need them. You don't need to give your jurors a, a legal lesson in order to, for them to grasp what kinds of causes we're gonna hold somebody legally responsible for. Here's how I used it uh, in my book to explain what a jury charge about causation might look like. And yes, we can play with the nuances of the case law day and night, but here's the essence of it. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you can't make people pay for harm they didn't cause, shouldn't expect, or when they only played a tiny role in causing the harm. The law instead makes a person responsible for harm when the person suing isn't mostly responsible for that harm, when the harm wouldn't have happened without a substantial contribution from the person sued, and when the person sued should have seen the harm coming or something very much like it. And that's probable cause, even though uh, approximate cause, and that's even though, by the way, typical approximate cause charges can take up two or three or four pages. That's it in plain English. Now, next, once uh, the jury's charge is over and uh, you're, you're going to make your, your arguments, you might be making those arguments to a jury. And if so, you know that the arguments are going to be made right at the end uh, of the case and you're going to make them directly to the jury. But when you're in court and you have a courtside trial, substitute longer closing arguments for the typically filed post-trial briefs. The argument is always best when it's immediately after the end of evidence, when everything's fresh in everybody's mind, uh, and the court is thinking about the case uh, in light of everything that's been said and done 
in front of them. Instead, the typical sequence in a courtside trial works like this in too many places on too many occasions. The parties say, well, we want to file briefs and we need the trial transcripts in order to file those briefs. Those trial transcripts take a month or two months to generate. Then the parties want another month after the receipt of the transcripts to file their initial briefs. Those initial briefs have to have responses filed to them and that takes other months. And of course the parties often move to extend the time for the briefing. And then there's a reply brief and that often the parties move to extend the time. Then you finally get to oral arguments. It could be six months to a year after the trial in which the judge has gone on to other trials and has totally forgotten the case. And many of the parties, lawyers have gone on to other trials as well. And they've forgotten the case too. And they all have to go back to the transcript and basically retry the case. Long closing arguments are usually better than post-trial briefs. Post-trial briefs simply substitute paper for people. In a long closing argument, the ideal that you'd want to aim for is a meaningful exchange with the judge. You make your strong points and the judge challenges you. Try to engage the judge in a conversation closing arguments. Closing arguments are not the best when they are speeches. And speeches of final strong points are good things, but a meaningful exchange with the judge would be even better. Of course, sometimes you can't get uh, the judge to ask any questions. There's not much you can do about that, but you can try by raising issues that might resonate with the judge, by anticipating questions the judge might have, having, by saying things like, you may be thinking, it might spark a response out of the judge that might show what the judge is thinking, that might thereafter then direct your questions to the judge or your responses to the questions of the judge in a direction helpful to your client. That's a strong way to end a case and the best recipe for winning it. In exchange with the judge, we resolve the judge's problems. When you do file briefs, whether they're pre-trial, post-trial, appeal, whatever they may be, remember you're, you're, you're speaking to human beings through your brief. Make your brief writing literary, not technical. Remember what Justice Holmes uh, said, and I quote in The Common Flaw, a word should be, as Holmes said, the skin of a living thought. He didn't say an accurate reflection of the speaker's meaning. Holmes believes words are alive. They're alive to ideas. They're alive to human values. They're alive to human conflicts. conflicts and they help us resolve those conflicts. Too much of brief writing uh, is dead. Complex cases don't necessarily require complex briefs. You shouldn't think that by belaboring the relative complexity of your case, that you're actually gonna convince the judge that it's more important or that you should win. The key is instead to focus around the key human values that are on your client's side when you're trying to show that your client was an honest person or your client's opponent was a dishonest person. There was lying, cheating, stealing, injuring circling around those things rather than belaboring the complexity of the case is the route to follow. And believe it or not, what we learned in high school about writing still should pertain today. I tell my, my two sons, one in college, one out of college, to keep following that formula. You start with an introductory paragraph and you introduce your three main ideas. You end with a paragraph that reaches a strong conclusion five separate sections. You'd be surprised at how much, even in the most complex cases, a formula like that uh, works. Each one of them, some passionate, engaging human discussion. Don't plot in your briefs through the history of the case and the familiar standards that we all know about. Don't open your briefs like that. Everyone does, and judges usually start their opinions to it. It is useless. It is needless. And many times the reader has absolutely no idea why you're telling us why the complaint was filed on a certain date, why a motion was filed on a certain date, what the rule on summary judgment is, when you already knows what it is, 
uh, and you don't need to see it there. Instead, use the procedural aspects of it, the procedural posture. Use the rules, the practice book rules, wherever you may be, only if you need them, only if they support your argument for getting the relief you want. Don't make them an empty ritual that people simply want to skip over in the hope that you're going to say something interesting at some time in your brief. Same for judges' opinions. Too many of them begin with this detritus. Use them if they're needed, but then only use them where they're needed. When you're talking about ultimately denying a summary judgment motion and you get through the facts and you say it should be denied, for instance, because uh, under these facts that were shown through the affidavits of the parties, there's a, a question that could go either way. And in summary judgment, if a reasonable juror can conclude either way, then in fact, summary judgment must be denied. Where it's needed, use it. Don't use it needlessly. Eliminate the needless details of reciting the evidence put on both sides. Weave it into your argument and only use the evidence you need. And please junk the jargon and spare us your acronyms. Give living, breathing names to the people who are in front of you. When you're up on appeal, choose your appellate issues as carefully as you would choose the issues that you're going to include in your complaint. Focus on quality rather than on quantity. Same thing should be on your mind. What is the human value in dispute? How does that human value come out in favor of your client? And why should the upper court agree with you? Again, three parts are better than nine. Uh, throw away the throwaways. You all know that you use your throwaways in your appellate briefs, and so do the appellate judges. Uh, and it's an annoyance and merely eats up those page limits that you're subject to in the appellate courts. Don't use up your page limits with the procedural postures and the other things that may have to say some mention. And don't use them up on your throwaway art. Do a better argument on your main arguments and get rid of the needless ones. Needless arguments detract from needful arguments. Now, let's cover the last topic that's been sort of lurking behind the curtain this entire time, at least in my mind, and maybe sometimes in your mind. And that is the role uh, that's played by the billable hour. It is the great promoter of needless complexity in, in case law. And that's because whether it's overt or whether it's subconscious, the billable hour invites more billable hours uh, and needlessly complicates cases. Too many lawyers think uh, that they answer for their money-making strategy, their career strategy is to bleed dry every billable hour case that they get can get a hold of. The reality is they're only accelerating the extinction of their species. Uh, in the common flaw, I explore this issue in detail. And you can see, for instance, and particularly in commercial disputes, in commercial litigations, there's been a steady decline in commercial litigation every year in good times and in bad. And that's because we're employing a bad business strategy we're making cases cost more, take longer, and usually result in an unsatisfying settlement as its resolution, instead of making it a speedy way of resolving a human complaint without bankrupting the parties. What do parties walk away from uh, when they walk away from court these days? Not wanting to ever be in court again. Bad business strategy, for you. I, I believe that if we can change the incentives that the billable hour creates, change the way we approach needless complexity in the court, we might even become a low cost alternative in the courts to arbitration. Now, there's a different dynamic uh, in every field, every type of endeavor, whether it's personal injury, contracts, et cetera. But the same need is in all of these cases, and that is the need to uh, align the interests of lawyers with their clients. Now, of course, in a contingency fee case, we know that you win or lose together. The client and the lawyer 
uh, bringing a contingency fee case, both have an incentive to recover as quickly as possible, as much as possible. But what do you do about the defense to align uh, their interests with their clients when they bill by the hour? Well, get rid of the billable hour. Use a minimum fee as a starting point. In most cases, a, a defendant has to consider, how much money would I lose if I lose this case? What percentage of that amount of potential loss would I pay to win the case uh, instead? You can start from building a minimum fee around that. And then above all, work in win those bonuses. You align your interests as if the lawyer isn't punished for winning the case early, the lawyer is rewarded. They get a minimum fee and they get on top of it a win bonus that can be greater for every point during the uh, process that is early in the process in which the win uh, occurs. I talk a lot about that in the common flaw because I really do think that the incentives of our system are damaging the system, both from the standpoint of the objective observer of the judge who has no financial stake in the case, but also from the perspective of lawyers who want more cases, who want people to want to go to court and hire them. Uh, and uh, in the case of a party who wants to hire a lawyer, uh, but realizes that if they take their dispute to court, uh, they're gonna lose one way or the other because they're gonna lose their money and their time, even if the result is somewhat satisfying. I'd ask you to think about that, those of you in the billable hourly world, there's a lot of talk going on about that. And we all know that uh, corporations, insurance companies and the like are putting caps on fees that are leading us in the same direction. It might do your billable hours, but there's gonna be a cap on them. Reinvent the billable hour. And we might be able to reinvent lawsuits in such a way as that people want to be part of them, want to be part of your profession. And with respect to the, to the business the larger business of having courts that dispense judgment. Doing that will get us back to what I've been talking about all along, is that the vindication of a human value is what a case should be about. We don't like people who lie, cheat, steal, or injure us. We don't like people who bring lawsuits against us alleging these things when they're false. If we can vindicate the defendant, by saying they didn't engage in that tactic, that, that conduct, or we can vindicate the party who brought the suit by saying, yes, one of our basic values enshrined in a law, whether it's case law or statute, has been violated in this case, uh, and that therefore a judgment is appropriate. We get at those human values, people are going to see that we have a system of justice and not a system uh, that we uh, can continue as we have to lose faith in. So I'd like to convince you that it's in all of our interests from the standpoint of the courts, from the standpoints of people who litigate to make the system actually work and vindicate those values. Uh, and a stronger, institu stronger institutions in the courts may help us keep stronger institutions in the country as a whole. I talk about all these things in the book, but the common flaw 50 specific points, but an overarching issue is to try to build, rebuild public confidence in the courts. Uh, you should realize it's in your interest to help in that. It'll succeed with it, help you succeed with your career and make you the thing that many in the private sector at least are trying to do more money. Thanks for your attention. It's been great to, to join you for this discussion. And I wish you good luck in your profession.